This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. I shouldn't be here. In this restaurant, heavy drapes block the sun, so it looks like evening even during the day. I'm at Churchill's in Spokane. There are lockers rented by patrons for laid-down bottles of premium wine. And the waitstaff dress in evening wear in tuxes, and they fold your crisp white napkin again moments after you leave your seat. Steak is what they do. So, to the cuts. The first steak on our dinner menu is the top sirloin. Now the sirloin our server brings over a huge tray of raw steaks wrapped in cellophane and gold foil to carefully explain each choice cut. Whereas when we move down to the ribeye and the cowboy rib steak, the most intense marbling here, plus the rivers of fat running throughout, you could really swim in these steaks. Now the cow- But I'm not really here for the steak. I'm here on a steak out. Beneath this restaurant, down some stairs, is a dim-lit bar with low ceilings. The booze are upholstered in oxblood velvet. This is a place where deals get made. And this particular night, there's a group of lawyers from the Easterday bankruptcy ordering the most expensive options. I'm not here to discover some big secret. But after chasing the Easter Day story for a solid two years, I just had to see this gathering in person. This whole fancy dinner is on Cody Easter Day's dime, but he wasn't invited. These lawyers just closed the Easter Day bankruptcy and earned themselves a nice paycheck north of $30 million. After my dinner, I steal off to the restroom. On my way, I peek inside the private room where the lawyers and guests are dining right near the framed portrait of Winston Churchill, men in small groups stand around sipping wine. They're mostly dressed in dark suits. It's hard to know what to make of this scene, but it feels like I'm witnessing a changing of the guard. Family farmers are on their way out. Corporations are the new settlers. In this final episode of Ghost Herd, we look at the myths we tell ourselves about the American dream and the West. And time's up. Cody Easterday goes to court. He faces the consequences of one of the largest cattle swindles in U.S. history. This is Ghost Herd. I'm Anna King. The West has long been seen as a place of optimism, especially for the settlers that came here, a frontier where someone can make a name and a fortune for themselves. That go West, young man ideal, it still looms over us in our old movies. A man could make an awful nice little cattle ranch in that valley. You know, if he didn't mind being lonesome. And had someone to kind of help him with the cooking and such. And it still lives with us today in fresh cut songs like this one from Jordan Davis. But the ownership of farmland in the American West has never been static. For example, Cody Easterday's father, Gail, got his start in ag at 17, working 300 acres of ground. The family was then able to build that into one of the largest farming and ranching operations in the Northwest. They had achieved the American dream. But now we're seeing a major shift again. When Cody was forced to sell off that empire, 
it went to the highest bidder, to Agra Northwest, for $210 million. And transactions like this are forcing us to examine the myths we tell ourselves about who owns this land and who has the power. What three generations of the Easter Days were able to build would be a lot more difficult if starting out today. Corporate competition, higher interest rates, bank requirements, all mean hard work doesn't guarantee the success that the Western myths of old have promised. In a way, I've got a lot in common with the Easter Days. When my father Gary was a young man, he desperately wanted to farm. My mother was delirious and unable to protest with flu in bed when he did the deal. A widow was selling property. She wanted to move to town since her husband had died. Dad went to see it. She told him it would be $2,000 down for all the acreage and asked, what did he do for work? Dad said he was in construction. She demanded, let me see your hands. Dad's hands were rough and calloused and cut up from work, the nails chewed down. Satisfied he was a worker, the widow said, all right. Dad sold his prized 56 Chev pickup, school bus yellow, with the big chrome grill. He and Mom scraped some more money up from family and moved to our place in the shadow of Mount Rainier. I grew up on that place with Hereford and Angus cattle and horses, fixing fence, running the wooded trails, plunking hazelnuts into a rusty coffee can in the summer. These experiences on this piece of ground formed my rural heart, and that upbringing has defined my career. Land deals like the one my dad made aren't common now, and I'm privileged to grow up in a family that had something to sell and the opportunity to buy that ground. In a way, it's a classic Western tale. These tales have shaped the American identity in many ways. But these old myths, the way our grandparents saw the West, can no longer sustain us. Like the myth that if a person works hard, they could own a bit of the American dream. Now, many farmers are just renting that dream. And if you pull these apart, you can find the little kernels in here. I'm standing with Daryl Miles at the edge of his 9,000-acre wheat field and pasture. It's big, wide, rolling, and open. The green heads of this wheat are in what's called the milk stage. That means the kernels are maturing, and if you pinch a kernel, there's a white liquid inside. His entire field is starting to go from green to gold, just weeks from harvest. It's awful pretty. Well, I wish it was thicker. <laughs> no, it's, it looks nice. I mean, it's, it's a fair stand. And all of this rain we've got, it should be feeling really nice. His place is called Juniper Dunes. It's a remote wheat ranch up here in Franklin County, a bit southeast of Basin City. And I like this area because it's, it's secluded. I mean, I my closest neighbor is over three miles from me. I don't, I don't have anybody right out my door. But Daryl doesn't own this ranch. He rents. Growing up on a farm but never owning a farm, I farm here because it's what I can get. Um, I don't own it. I have I have to basically take what I can I can I can get a lease on. And so that's what put me here. Many family farmers rent these days. Daryl's landlords live all over the country. I'm not sure that some of them have ever been here. <laughs> In the Columbia Basin today, an acre of irrigated ground goes for about $20,000. And you have to have hundreds of acres of irrigated corn or potatoes or thousands of dryland crops like wheat just to make it. And even rents are getting high, at 500 to 1,000 an acre for an annual rent, depending on what the ground is raising. Daryl says he's been a renter all his life. He wasn't handed any ground as a young man. Interest rates were too high to buy when he was young. 
Back in the 90s, he had to have 40% down to even touch a place. And now at 59, he could never work enough to pay back the sum. But some farmers do own their land, building on it for generations, like the Easter days. This gives them a leg up. They can be bigger, get economies of scale, and gain more power from field to table. If you've got land and you've got it paid for, your financial situation's much easier. So my neighbors who have farmed the same place that they inherited or bought way back, um, when we go through the bad years, and we always go through the bad years, they're in a, in a better position to ride those years out. That's the value of owning dirt. Having that equity gives you serious advantages you don't have as a renter. And as a landowner, you've got more security, and you can take bigger risks. Well, to throw out some old, old numbers, so the place that I used to farm sold for a million three in 98. The payment on it in round numbers was $90,000 a year. The year you pay that place off, you just got a $90,000 raise. $90,000 raise, pretty big deal when the margins are tight. Even though Daryl doesn't have the advantages of owning land, he still takes a lot of pride in the work he does. But he sees a difference when corporations are involved. Daryl told me that when a corporation or hedge fund step in, what matters is the dollar. Profits over place. A close relationship to this valuable ground, to the landscape, is dwindling with absent landowners, people with no connection to the West. And you can see that in the weeds, literally. In the dry land country, these noxious weeds are a problem. And rye is considered a noxious weed in your wheat. This is Marv, Olivia Grassl's father. She and her husband, Stacy Niveton, were the people with the potato problems I talked to earlier. Marv's family moved here in 1951, the same year that he was born. He's known this land his entire life, and he's obsessed with eradicating weeds from wheat fields. He's especially got it out for the rye. And if you don't take care of it, it creates a major problem. You get deducted on your price. Marv's clothes are still dusty from working in the fields this morning. He was pulling weeds just before we sat down to talk. His hands are stained from the soil. Now we've only got another few more days and it's too late. Things have gone to seed. And that's why I got to get out there and keep these, some of these noxious weeds from taking over. I can show you that a sea of rye, it gets five, six feet tall. It will choke out kochia. It'll choke out a lot of the cheatgrass. Marv can name hundreds of the weeds that are problems for farmers here. The scotch thistle, yellow star thistle, skeleton weed, rush skeleton weed. Dalmatian toad flax. Snapdragon. The tree of heaven? It's actually a tree of hell. <laughs> Marv tells me that some investor in Chicago or wherever has no clue about these weeds. They just trust that people like Marv will be around to manage it for them. He believes that they have other priorities. He says investors and people who farm from afar extract resources from an area like miners. What does a miner do? Take out the resources? And uh, if they're not putting back into the ground or putting back into that crop what they need to to take care of it, you got problems. And there's, that's the way it is in some of these places. So you're saying these corporations kind of mine the area. It's like they, they, take the, they take all the money and they take the crop, but they're not, they're not putting back into the fair. They're not putting back into the churches or the schools or the communities. I didn't say that. You okay. said that. No, I'm, <laughs> I, I can get it so wrong, get though. You, you correct me. You correct me. Tell me what's right. They're not that invested in the area because they don't have the, the history. They're, they don't They don't live here. I mean, you know, think about it. If you live in this area and you want your children and your grandchildren to stay with it, 
you're going to invest in the area. And that's what happened. That's why you want to have local people involved instead of people from wherever, Washington, D.C. Do they have a clue what's going on here? No. But Marv wonders what will happen when he's gone. He says this passion for weeds and caring for the land is something that you're born into. And I try to teach it to my children, my son-in-laws and my grandchildren that you got to respect the land and take care of it. And it's an, it's a lo- it's a lot of work, hard work and a lot of time and money. Long before corporations started moving in on this land, there was another dynamic shift in the power structure that ruled the West. Native Americans were here first. Now they own just a fraction of their original land, but many maintain a close relationship to all of that dirt. I think that farming and ranching families that have been here five and six generations have relationships like that as well. But for us, it's not like one place is as good as another place. I drive down I-84 to Bobby Connor's place outside of Pendleton, Oregon, to see this relationship firsthand. It's all of the places together that are that landscape of memory that embraces us and enfolds us and enriches us. And I just can't imagine life without that. It's hard. Up on top of Cabbage Hill, I meet Bobby. She's with her horses. Just hold the gate for us for a second. On a late summer's evening, Bobby Connor, with her brother Brian, grooms one of her horses named Tennessee. He's a 28-year-old gelding captured in the BLM desert near Burns. She runs a metal curry comb over his haunches. Grass seed and stickers will travel up into the tail and just annoy the heck out of him. She uses her fingernails to pinch weed seeds out from the base of his tangled tail. He could have rubbed his whole tail off if he was really in bad shape, but clearly he hasn't done that. The sun is going down across the Umatilla Basin and the Columbia Plateau. Tennessee shifts his feet. Bobby is the head of the Temascalit Cultural Institute, the only museum along the Oregon Trail that tells the story of Western expansion from a tribal point of view. Bobby bought this land partly because it's an elk nursery. It's where mother elk come to have their calves each year. She tells me that her sense of ownership is an accountability to the land. It's something that she learned from her mother, grandmother, and uncle. So my cousins who grew up in Idaho had the places where they got medicine. They had the places where they got their meat. They had the places where they got their fish. And so we all have relationships with place. For Native Americans like Bobby, land, food, water, and people are all in a relationship with each other. The salmon that swim up the Columbia are brothers, and the roots they dig are sisters. They are relatives coming back to feed the people. Bobby of the Umatilla Reservation in Oregon says a table is a metaphor for the universe that is Native culture. So the food's on the table when they're set at feast. You know, water is the first thing we take and the last thing we take a sip of. But a taste of the salmon, a taste of the various fishes. During these religious ceremonies, foods are tasted by the people one by one as leaders call their names. Chush for the water, nusuk for the salmon, and nukt for the meat. Kaush for one of the types of roots, and wunu for the berries all done as a sacrament to remember the law that sustains our people, which is that if they take care of us, we have to take care of them in their home. That's a covenant we have with everything else that lives here and a covenant with the Creator that gave us this fabulous place to live. When we get back, 
Cody is sentenced for his crimes. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. The growth of the Easterday farm and ranch is one story of Western expansion. Cody created 265,000 fake cattle, a ghost herd. His swindle speaks to the drive to be bigger, produce more, grow, build, get more for yourself. But he could only live like that for so long. He got caught, and Cody was forced to sell off much of his empire to pay those debts and he pled guilty to his crimes. The community has been waiting two years for him to be sentenced, wondering how much time, if any, he will serve for his crimes. And now he's about to stand before the federal judge, and Cody's actions have forever changed the reputation of the Easterday Empire. I mean... He broke the law. And I don't care who you are, if you break the law, you should do time. I don't I don't feel sorry for Cody. I feel sorry for the people around him. They are gonna have to deal with the sins of the father. Just the publicity for agriculture and the trust in the public eye. That was the part that's very unfortunate. A lot of those people lost their jobs, and those weren't high-paying jobs. So he hurt a lot of people with his actions. Easter Days was a brand name, and it's unfortunate that this had to happen to them, and I think they would like to reclaim their good name. I'm standing outside the courtroom where Cody Easterday will receive his sentence. I'm in this hall with about 60 people who aren't a fan of my reporting on Cody. My hands sweat and I'm feeling sick in my stomach, but... It's nearly the atmosphere of a wedding in the hall. (laughs) Women are sporting heels and beachy hair, and they're in tight bunches. Some have purses with long tan leather fringe. Men in dress shirts and suits shift their weight back and forth. Others in boots and straw hats lean up against walls, waiting expectantly, eye in the crowd, and neighbors slap hands as each newcomer enters. Everyone files into the courtroom, and Cody takes a seat at the large table on the left facing the judge, his back to his wife and children seated in the front row. There's no recording or cell phones allowed, and Cody's face is ruddy from decades of the Columbia Basin's beating sun. His forehead is blank white like a sheet of crisp paper from always being protected under his hat. He wears a blue dress shirt, and a dark sports coat with khaki pants. On his silver belt buckle rides the family's steer head, punched there in gold. This is Cody's sentencing hearing. Lawyers will argue to the federal judge how many years Cody will get. The prosecution goes first with its argument. The lawyer says Cody's case is massive, brazen, and long-term. The prosecution says Cody lied to those that had the misfortune of trusting him as a business partner. The lawyer argues this is a serious crime and Cody deserves a serious penalty, 
asking for a sentence of 10 to 12 years. Cody's defense lays out a story of a lifelong farmer with deep ties to his community. The defense also emphasizes Cody's inability to dig himself out of his gambling addiction on the futures market. He became secretive and distant with his family. He lost and lost and lost. Finally, it's Cody's turn to speak. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry to all the people who have supported me through this whole thing. I'm sorry. This is not the man I am. The court takes a ten-minute recess. The crowd speaks in low voices. Some of the buoyancy of before is gone. And then the judge comes back to give us ruling. The federal judge explains how he has had to hand down sentences for crimes related to crystal meth, fentanyl, and other addictions. He says, I don't see the difference here. The judge says, this empire you built, you've destroyed. Cody's boys shift in their seats, bending low elbows to knees. Debbie, Cody's wife, pat pats one son's broad back, a man, but still a child. Then the judge hands down the sentence, 132 months. That's 11 years. If the mood was expectant, like a matrimony on the way in, then coming out, it's a funeral. People look grim, shocked, and walk quickly for the door, single file. Cody walks right past me, head down. He doesn't look in my direction. Some women cry, then they turn to go. They still have a long drive ahead back to Basin City. I've stuck this ride of a story for two years. Since this news broke, Cody hasn't talked to me, and I do have empathy for him and his family. They'll be forever changed. Now, the next generation of Easter Days must carry on the family's legacy without the help of their father. Cody's daughter, Cody D., is about 27. The young men, Cole, Clay, and Cutter, are about 25, 23, and 21. The three sons have started a new farm. They've been pushed to the margins of the Columbia Basin. The sons' maroon semi-trucks haul loads of onions and potatoes on highways near where their grandfather Gale died in that terrible crash. On the truck doors, the old vinyls that once said Easterday Farms have been peeled off. Now the new company name of the young men Triple E Farms replaces it. But some things remain, like the Steerhead family brand, emblazoned in silver, riding shotgun on the door. The brand, seared into this family's history and hide, rides on. When you're a farmer, the land becomes a part of you. You breathe it. You eat it. It's under your nails. You even eat a bug now and again. It's in you. And reputation, too, is a part of you. There's a weight to it. It plays a part in what you can and can't do in life. And Easterday's reputation has taken a major hit. Farm families work the same ground for generations. So these boys can't run from their name. They can't start over. Just time on it will crust over the hurt, the damage, the reputation. Late last year, Cody got in his pickup, maybe with his wife, and drove in and reported for prison. I imagine he drove past icy irrigation pivots, 
hovering just above snowy potato fields like dino-sized steel dragonflies. A bleak, grim winter, farmland asleep. Perhaps Cody would have noticed something small going wrong in a field, something out of place, but have no time to fix it. A farm kid now, 51, with no free time left. A ghost no longer visible on this vast, bitter landscape. He'll keep driving towards the reckoning. And when spring arrives, Cody's children will have to figure out the planting without him. Now, quickly grown, they'll try to step in and plow out their father's mistakes. This is Ghost Herd. I'm Anna King. Ghost Herd is a joint production of KUOW, Puget Sound Public Radio, and Northwest Public Broadcasting, both members of the NPR Network, a coalition of public media podcast makers. To support our work, contribute to KUOW, NWPB, or your local NPR station, and tell a friend or two about this podcast. It helps. Ghost Herd is produced by Matt Martin and me, Anna King. Whitney Henry Lester is our project manager. Jim Gates is our editor. Fact-checking by Lauren Vespoli. Cultural edit by Giselle Halfmoon. Our logo artwork is designed by Heather Willoughby. Special thanks to Kara williams Fry, Arvid Hokinson, Sue Ann Ramella, Christy George, and Eric Stahl. Our production team includes Juan Pablo Chiquiza, Megan Farmer, Michaela Giannotti, Jolene Lowey, Caitlin Nicholas, Amelia Peacock, Tia Popescu, Hans Twite, Lisa Wong, and Brendan Sweeney. Original music written and performed by James D. Kindle, recorded by Addison Schulberg, with additional musicians Roger Conley, Andy Steele, and Adam Lang. I'm your host, Anna King. If you have thoughts or questions about Ghost Herd, we're listening. Get in touch at kow.org slash feedback.